Okay, so good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the eighth webinar in the series Making Data Good for Society. Uh, my name is Mark Humphreys, and I'm the chairman of Dharma UK. I'm delighted to be hosting this uh, series of webinars with the BCS Data Management Specialist Group. Um, this is the eighth in our series today, um, and today I'm very happy um, to, 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 to welcome Stuart Kitney, um, who is from the um, Data um, National Physical Laboratory. Um, David is a career scientist with over 20 years um, and has gone, you know, done, worked in science for all, all his career, um, uh, including a um, time of, um, he, he's been an inventor um, and is currently working at the, the National Physical Laboratory, um, where he is the head of the department. Um, so David is going to be talking to us today about creating a digital measurement infrastructure. Um, an awful lot of um, data is created by, um, by machines, by sensors, um, and um, you know, what they've done at the National Physical Laboratory is to create a, a, um, a whole framework for collecting data, for defining um, how that data should be collected, gathered, and so on, in order to build in data quality from the start. Um, in order to do this, they've, they've built on their um, their rich heritage of collecting data and measuring data in the um, in, in the pursuit of um, physical sciences. Um, so it should be it's a really hardcore presentation, I think, for for, for, for data geeks this afternoon. Um, so I'm really looking forward to it. Um, just a couple of notes before we get started. Um, if you have any questions, um, please enter them in the chat. Um, and uh, the uh, session will be accompanied, like all our sessions this week, um, by um, journalism, who will be documenting in a graphical way uh, the, uh, the, the presentation that, um, that Stuart will be giving. Um, so without, oh, before I hand over to Stuart, just one quick plug. Um, there is a, um, uh, the BCS bookshop. Um, is offering a 30% discount to all attendees to this webinar series. Um, the code is on your screen now. So BCS data, um, this is a 30% discount valid until uh, valid from between June 13th to the 19th. Okay, so without further ado, um, I'm going to hand over to Stuart. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, very much appreciate the introduction and thank you to BCS and Dam UK for the opportunity to present today. So I'll just quickly share my screen and make sure I share the right one. Um, there we are. Hopefully we can all see that. Is is that good? Are we good to go? Yeah, that's coming through. Fantastic. And let me just put it in presentation mode. Right, brilliant. Um, so yes, so uh, Max give a very good summary of of the National Physical Laboratory and my role as head of uh, data science at MPL. Um, I've also recently taken up the Heads of Skills and Training, um, Head of Department role, uh, and I'll spend a little bit of time towards the end of the presentation just actually talking about how those quite closely interlink um, and some of the work that we're doing around um, skills for data science um, and understanding the needs and requirements uh, of metrology um, for data science and the skills that are required there. So uh, some of you will be quite aware of MPL, but I'll just wanted to give a quick potted history. Um, I think it's a broad audience today. So I just wanted to make sure that I, I, I give a, a good description of what MPL is, what MPL does, um, and we can start from there. So MPL um, was formed in 1900 um, uh, by Richard Glazebrook as a uh, fellow of the Royal Society, um, as the, the first director of MPL, uh, and, and very much a remit around looking at and making sure that there was um, direct interaction with UK industry and commerce. Um, and so there was an official opening in 1902 by the then Prince of Wales, Royal Highness of Prince of Wales, who went on to become George V. Um, and the statement there that is listed, that, that quote, I think is very pertinent to really describe um, MPL's role. And that mission statement realistically has not changed significantly in the 120 years that we've been in existence of an organization. So it's very much around taking scientific research and making sure that, that that knowledge can be transferred into industrial and commercial life to break down that barrier between theory and practice um, for, the, for the greater good of UK industry and society. And very much the mission statement of the organisation now, um, particularly around some of the large national programmes that we're working on, um, looking to, to, to address the challenges around 
climate change and net zero, uh, early detection of neurogenitive diseases, um, challenges around um, timing resilience, um, and a whole portfolio of, of, of areas of research that we work in that I'll cover um, in a little bit more detail uh, in following slides. Um, one additional um, highlight here that I would like to flag from 1907 was how, um, so in effect, what was MPL's first measurement service? So it began testing of taxi meters, which it continued for, for 50 years, um, at its peak testing 10,000 a year. And in effect, it, that, that is a good way of understanding how we directly interact with UK industry and the value that we bring. And because we have hundreds of measurement sciences now within MPL that can range from hydrophone calibration um, all the way across to antenna um, calibration, electromagnetic testing. And it just gives a, a broad understanding and range of how the initial measurement service has expanded into supporting that UK industry and, and internationally as well around calibration and being the highest point of reference through primary standards, secondary standards, relating back to the international system of units. So if we move on to the second page of history and highlights. Um, and I flag two in particular that are probably quite relevant to this audience. Um, so it was the well, the, the, the work that began on the world's first automatic computing engine um, that is very well known in terms of the, 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 the value and the benefit that bring brought in terms of computing and how we've advanced and the work of Alan Turing. Um, and I've been told um, by a colleague, Keith Lyons, that the very first um, head of department for data science that in effect led up this team. Um, had an interesting relationship with Alan Turing, and I think it's covered in his autobiography. So Keith Lyons gave me that tip off, who's quite um, quite a prevalent member of BCS, um, and Keith has presented on that um, previously. Um, but that work took place at MPL, as did the first atomic cesium clock that was developed um, to really provide that accuracy um, that atomic clocks bring and how this then has circulated worldwide as part of the, the National um, uh, Measurement Institute community um, to provide that in comparisons and resiliency around timing. So this has actually developed into a large um, national program called the National Timing Centre um, that NPL is now leading. And this is to implement uh, a node approach to, um, to atomic clock location across the UK to build in um, timing resiliency so that it it, de it develops that core infrastructure um, that will always maintain and, and, and develop a, a resiliency that, that, that prevents um, outages and challenges. And that, that's built upon the initial work that was done around cesium clocks in 1955. And then the final highlight was um, uh, Donald Davis and the work that he did around packet switching um, and the, the, the development that that's had um, around local networks um, and that, how that was built upon from 1966 onwards um, and um, quite well known um, area of work and re relates to specifically areas that MPL have moved into um, historically from historic um, research to, to, to the modern day. So the, the link in that will be provided in the slide deck when it's shared is, is a very good document that if you'd like to know more, um, do feel free to access and review. Uh, it gives a, a really good summary of the 120 years of history of MPL. So th again, this really speaks to um, what MPL's role was and what it still is um, in terms of producing, reprodu uh, providing reproducibility in science um, and quality in measurement. And this has two key focuses really. So it, it's how the, the research and, and scientific capability that we develop then is disseminated into industry and provides um, social impact um, and um, benefit and it's got two key areas really it's very much focused around essential for governments and society to improve effectiveness and efficiency of science trusting its outcomes um, the development of evidence-based policy i'm thinking particularly around net zero and climate change um, if we have a 15-year uncertainty window um, regarding um, decisions we make today um, being the, the impact being visible, then we really do need to reduce that uncertainty down so that we can be more confident that we are taking the correct decisions today, whether it's electrification of transport, whether it's moving to a hydrogen economy, how have we got confidence that, that making those decisions now will have the, the correct and right impact in terms of lo, um, reducing the effects of climate change, making sure that we don't tip over that 1.5 degree um, increase in global temperature. 
Um, so th th there's a lot of work that's going on within the lab at the moment to really try to, to, to support that evidence base um, policy. Let's go back previous slide. Policy. I was just um, dealing with a, a call, apologies, a Teams call. That's the, the challenges of working um, remotely. Um, just the final point was accelerating, accelerating progress in science and its associated benefits. And then how this um, is transferred into industry through reduces of waste, um, increasing value, money and productivity, unlocking potential for innovation um, and decreasing time to, and to implement change and add value. And these key bullet points stand the test of time just as much as they did in 1900 and 1902 when the, the inception of the lab to the current day um, work that we currently deliver. So how do we do that? So we're part of a national measurement system. Um, the text there explains what the national measurement system is and what it's there to deliver. Um, the publication there on the Government UK website um, provides more information, but this is a collective of NPL is the National Measurement Institute in the UK, so the designated NMI, working with um, other designated institutes. So that's NML, which is the National Measurement Lab within LGC, the Gears Lab up in Newcastle, NIBS, and then NEL that provide that resilience and understanding of dissemination of the SI um, reference to primary and secondary standards and the highest point of re reference for measurement. So that's a background of NPL, background of what the, the measurement system is, how we fit into that. Um, and just moving on to what MPL is today, um, I've already explained that MPL is the UK's National Measurement Institute. Um, we have over 600 multidisciplinary scientists, um, over 200 visiting researchers. Um, uh, but as a government owned lab um, um, that report into Bayes, in effect, we we are a step removed from, from, from government. Um, through our ownership structure and, and provide independent and impartial advice and are there to solve problems and design the right solutions. So if you think back to where MPL started and its, its core focus in the early years, it, it is very much expanded into a broad remit of activity um, and just, just captures the research that um, we conduct, um, all the particular areas. And you can see that it, it spans all the way across from biometrology to, to quantum physics. Um, data science is a, a particularly new department within MPL, but actually historically, MPL has always had math, mathematics and statistician capability, um, has always done design of experiment, um, has, has always had um, what you would class as data scientists within different areas or different research groups within MPL. Um, now we've got the opportunity to more explicitly call it out. Um, so where did data science at MPL come from? Well, actually, this underpins where we are heading as uh, a national lab or a metrology institute, um, building um, a whole program of work across the whole lab, um, focusing on um, generating confidence in data. So this just isn't um, specific to the data science department. And this builds on an internationally um, recognized workshop that not only had in, uh, national representation, but um, representation from NIST, for example, the US counterpart to MPL, um, that took place in 2017, um, the, at the end of 2016, sorry, the, the report was published in early 2017, that really flagged these pressing industry challenges. And I think everybody that works with data um, will understand some of these difficulties, some of these concerns, um, how you go around um, addressing them and, and fixing them. Um, um, but there was a real focus on what a metrology lab should have as, it, as its focus. What is our remit addressing some of these challenges that others will not be doing? Um, and it comes down to four key areas. So it's trust in data algorithms and software. It's merging multiple disparate data sources, um, storage and curation and the reuse of the data um, and support for decision making. Um, and the support for decision making is one of the key aspects that metrology or measurement science brings to being able to have confidence in those data, in, in the data that you are using. Um, and I will use a slide in, in, in slightly further on that will really build that picture as to how the data that's collected initially from a measurement modality then moves through the data life cycle um, and making sure that you understand 
the provenance of the data um, and how it's traceable back to that original measurement. So we use the word confidence a lot um, at MPL or beginning to um, in terms of what our role is as we move from the, the physical world of measurement into something that looks much more like a digital world. Um, and so just to clarify what confidence means from a metrology perspective, um, I, think, I think these are six key points to really highlight. And I think the first one in particular really does speak to what uh, a, me a measurement institute brings to uh, the confidence in data. And it's, it's understanding how good the measurement was that created the data in the first place. Was it fit for purpose? Was the data that was generated exactly what you were looking to achieve from that particular measurement? And as the measurement becomes more challenging, or you're using sensor networks that have different variability of calibration, um, history or, or, or parameters um, may be used in different ways, different formats of data generation. It's understanding how that original measurement um, can actually be transferred through into decisions. It's making sure you've got enough information about the measurement conditions um, so that the, the data you generated is suitable for your application. Um, and what effect any processing has had on the data um, and how you're tracking that and how you've got problems around that, those post-processing post steps. Um, the key aspects that speak to metrology um, is the understanding of uncertainty quantification and how that propagates through a life cycle, um, the provenance of the data and the metadata associated with it, and what metadata is required, what standards already exist and what don't, and how as a as a, a metrology laboratory we can influence or in, be involved in the national quality infrastructure to make sure that measurement standards of the future are fit for purpose and then we move into um, a very challenging topic is around trusted algorithms on software um, application of machine learning um, AI and particularly if you're using black box systems how, um, how are you explaining the decisions that have been made how is it trustworthy and in what way are you are you uh, confirming the the outputs of these systems in a way that they can be trusted across many different sectors, uh, whether it's a clinician looking at a quantitative image, um, or whether it's on the the, the in a, a nuclear power plant or a factory floor. There's there's different requirements for different industries, and while agnostic approaches can be taken, that that's not always the answer, and you may have to be domain specific. So um, I mentioned the data life cycle. Um, and the way that we phrase um, the challenges around um, the, the data life cycle and, and the key aspects of it. And it comes down to three areas that I think really separates out where the, 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 the measurement aspect of the life cycle comes in and then what happens with the data after that. So you collect the data in some shape or form through a sensor system. It could be a thermocouple, it could be LIDAR, radar, it could be um, visually through a camera, so correlated imaging. Um, and that, that, that data is captured um, and then connected in some shape or form. So this then means that you've got to understand communications, 5G, 6G, comms aspect of transferring the data. And then how the data is stored, um, in what capacity, what is what is used, what isn't stored, um, whether you're looking at uh, edge computing as an approach um, to then move to comprehension. So you've collected the data, you've, you've transmitted and stored it, you then fuse and process um, and then make decisions and analysis on the back of that data life cycle. And this could be very seen in a very simple form um, in a linear system, but actually if you move to much more complex systems, so where uh, multimodality of metadata and different measurement and, and different scales of measurement and, and data capture, um, and then implement um, post data uh, processing um, application of algorithms, um, machine learning, the challenge then becomes even more difficult to, to, to really understand um, what um how, how you can trust the the final outcome and the decision that's been taken and you see there from the other in data inputs that can be put into that life cycle that makes the the, the um the whole picture much more challenging um and difficult to understand and so this this is really about understanding how the uncertainty propagates so that the the data is traceable um back to the initial measurement and let's not forget as i explained on the previous example 
you, you can propagate uncertainty all the way through the data life cycle and think you've got traceability back to um, the initial measurement, but you've also got to bear in mind is that where the, the key skill of metrology comes in is making sure that that initial measurement was fit for purpose, that it would generate the data that you understood and required and needed. Um, and so this leads us to be able to impact and influence date validation and points and standards um, for data capture, validation standards for data curation. And I'll give an example of some work that we're doing um, in that area in a few slides. And then standards and validation for weighting of algorithms and explainable AI, um, an area that's quite a hot topic and others are looking at but we very much come at it from the, the aspect of understanding the, the measurement requirement that's generated the data in the first place. So if, and I, I, that sums up how traceability and uncertainty quantification um, actually supports adoption of, of a lot of these tools um, and some of the challenges that, have, that, that will be faced until we, we address these difficulties. Um, will always um, hamper adoption of, of tools such as AI, for example. So I, I just wanted to give a real world example um, that a colleague of mine has presented previously um, that I think is a really nice couple of slides as a summary. So I, I, I've rushed through some aspects of confidence in data and now that, that applies to the data life cycle. But I, I think until you, you view it in, in the reality of, of well, real world examples, it can be a challenge to exactly understand you know, what this all means and, and where the measurement aspect of these data challenges are. So if you look at um, the, the, the fitting or, or the use of a pacemaker, for example, um, there's, there's obviously the procedure that somebody goes through, um, hospitalization, all of the interaction with clinicians, surgeons for this procedure to take place. But then there's the post-operative care and the constant monitoring. And so in some shape or form, you'll have a localized device that is monitoring performance and then a team that is reviewing that data capture. Um, and we, we move through all of these cycles, um, as, as I'll do now, that gives you an idea as to just some of the challenges that can be faced um, at every, every step. So you've got remote monitoring device. Um, How is that being calibrated? Um, who's calibrated, uh, what data set is it collecting, um, what unit of measurement, um, who's, who's actually certified and verified that that, that that is accurate. So in a clinical setting, um, you'd expect that to be um, a, a key aspect of um, approval and regulation. But if we move to a world where we're using wearables much more and we're going to be using them diagnostically, then the challenge here comes as to, to the, the accuracy of that measurement that is taken. Um, so there's, there's a role to play, they play there for metrology and measurement. Um, then tools may be applied and used um, for analysis. Are they AI based? Um, what tool, um, what verification has that been through? What data set has it been trained on um, that gives you the confidence that the outputs can be trusted? Uh, and then and then you move through to the volume of data and the periodicity of it. Is, is it captured often enough? Um, is it good enough um, for and fit for purpose for use? And um, comes back to understanding that measurement modality and, it, and its accuracy. Um, and if it's measuring the correct thing and doing it accurately. And then we come to the human interpretation. Um, so a sonographer may take a slightly different view um, as to what they visibly see when somebody comes into hospital. So if you go through this whole cycle, you've, you've used a remote device to monitor, it's flagged an issue, it's reviewed by a team um, that may not be clinicians, they may have um, broader experience in terms of um, the data that's been generated from, from a review team. Um, they, the data may be analyzed by tools. Um, there's an issue spotted, you called in, a sonographer does a review on you. Um, per, the independent interpretation in terms of being, how they've been trained, uh, it has the training um, on the data sets that they've used um, been um, standardized? Um, how, how is that have been approved and reviewed across, across the UK and internationally? Um, so the variability there. Um, and then we come to um, quantitative uh, analysis and whether this is quantitative imaging or whether this is measurement that's been taken that um, you're treating as quantitative. Is it truly quantitative? What is the measurement that's been used? What is the unit of measurement that's been used? 
um, that builds that confidence um, that you can re make re and re infer real world decisions from that measurement. Um, and how robust are the biomarkers and the calculations that are, that are used, that are the information collected there, um, and the thresholds for biomarkers um, and how they account for measurement uncertainty. And finally, um, is there a better way of capturing and storing the data and managing patient data? So we've gone through this whole cycle before you, so where somebody has, has been admitted into hospital hospital or they may have been called in to be to, to have their case reviewed, um, their biomarkers checked, um, then it comes back to um, the GP setting where the, the information will be communicated back to the individual. Um, but where what standardization is around is there around capturing and storing data that um, um, the team at MPL have worked on missing data sets um, within the GP um, community and the impact that that can have. And so you can see through this whole cycle that there are many aspects and opportunities where rigor around measurement um, would underpin um, confidence in the decisions that are taken at each stage, but actually ultimately for the patient would give them the confidence that the, 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 the clinical care that they are receiving has gone through that rigor at each particular stage and they can feel as though that um, they, the, the duty of care that they've been given and the outcome is the absolute optimum for that individual. So that's in the, the life sciences area and we, we've done a number of projects that are focusing these, some of these particular topics um, and the link in the bottom left of the slide is, is a very good one to review some of that activity and who we've worked with and the impact that that has brought. I was just going to move on to a, a, another topic around the short autonomy, because um, I think this is quite a pertinent one and, and a hot topic at the moment in terms of um, whether you see it as land, air or sea and as transport. But, but one aspect that we've looked at is um, to, from a connected autonomous vehicles perspective, um, on, on road, um, so a program of work that we've done recently with the uh, Connected Places Catapult um, commissioned by the Centre for Connected and Autonomous Vehicles looked at performance testing for sensors. Um, how are you validating these sensors? But bear in mind that an autonomous car has a, a multitude and suite of sensors, so it's a complex sensor network. It's got camera, it's got LiDAR, it's got radar, it's got ultrasound. And how are they interacting um, independently, but actually collectively, especially when you introduce different climate environments. So I can see of the Met Office is a good, good diagram that really shows that actually there's some very different um, interaction and results that you get from different modalities of measurement. And it's just understanding um, what impact that, that whether um, changes in um, profile, changes in environment can have on this suite of sensors. So it's a really good summary of how a, 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 a vehicle on the road can be seen as a complex sensor network and how that then can pose challenges um, for decision making um, of an autonomous vehicle. And this, this is a key challenge if we're going to fully adopt a short autonomy. This isn't just on the road. It could be land, air, or sea. It could be it could be robotics within a manufacturing environment. So if we're fully adopting autonomy, then understanding the modalities of the measurement and the the the, the quality of the data um, that is generated is absolutely key. Um, and so one of the things that, um, as well as the large projects we're working on at MPL, we're also very much um, interested in data quality. As obviously, and this, this relates directly to this virtual conference this week and some of the presentations that have been given. So I'll, I'll give a snapshot of what MPL is, the areas that are working, a couple of examples, try to expand on what confidence is from a metrology aspect. Um, so I'll now move on to um, just some specifics around data quality and what the future for metrology looks like and where the role for MPL and the international NMI community lies. Um, just as a bit of a, a break from all of the detail and a barrage of information, um, I actually reflected on what autonomous vehicles are and autonomy. Um, so my reference point would be 1989 and Back to the Future 2 um, and the flying car. Um, I'm interested to know if anybody can actually remember the date that was in Back to the Future 2 and the year and the specific date, if anybody does know that, but I know the year. Um, it's been and gone, by the way. Um, that they'd meant to have traveled to. 
Um, and interestingly, we're nowhere near flying cars and we're, we're very far behind being able to get to level five autonomy as well um, because there are a number of challenges in this space. Um, and it doesn't just come down to um, the data quality, uh, understanding and, and trustworthiness of the algorithms that are used in autonomy. There's big, big challenges around the environment as well um, that may actually mean we have to reinvent what um, what the roads look like for autonomy truly to be implemented. So if you imagine a motorway, for example, um, much, much more simple for an autonomous vehicle to navigate. There's not cyclists, there's not pedestrians, there's not um, the unsurprising vehicle pulling out of a, a left-hand turn. Um, and, and so it, it, this all comes back to the human interaction aspect that, that cannot just be um, it's solved by um, understanding of, of measurement or the metrology aspect of it or data quality either. Um, and there's, there's just a couple of other um, reference points there that I just wanted to flag just, just for uh, interest is that um, Blade Runner's before my time, but there's a flying car there as well. I'm always lo looking, obviously looking into the future. Um, and then there's, there's Richard Browning there um, that in effect is a jetpack man flying um, unaided other than, than himself. And that news article there is, is quite interesting because it, it basically it talks about will flying cars ever take off? Well, we're nowhere near will auto autonomous cars um, end upon our roads. And so I, I think it's an interesting challenge to look at and understand because if we're really going to truly adopt this type of technology in the future, then autonomy is the only way that it will actually be embedded and and will be trustworthy in a way um, that takes the, the human out of the loop, but many, many challenges to address there. Um, and we are just one of many that are trying to look at how you deal with those difficulties. So we move on to confidence in data from a future perspective um, and what that actually means. And so this fits very much into digital metrology infrastructure. What will metrology look like in the future? Um, and MPL has done a lot of great foresighting work recently in the past two years to, to really look at what the future of agenda for metrology should be. And I, th I think a lot of these topics will chime with, with your own areas of expertise and interest, um, but it does very much come at it from a metrology perspective to make sure that MPL, but also the broader NMI community are looking to address the correct challenges, working with others um, collaboratively to build this infrastructure. Um, uh, and many of these topics build upon work that's already gone before, as you would imagine. So it's, it's making sure there's traceability chains with short, that, with, that are shortened and reduce uncertainty, um, traceability to the, uh, the SI and a digital framework for the SI and how that will be disseminated into industry um, and, and by what means. Um, so do, do we and should we and we will move away from artifacts being sent into uh, the national physical laboratory to be calibrated and move more towards in situ and dynamic calibration. Um, and then we move to understanding complex systems, which is particularly relevant for, for net zero. And if you look at all of the challenges around climate change and how you just under, understand and address model based approaches with data that is collected through Earth observation, for example, and land based emissions. Um, so, it, it, and, and we've got to get to a point where we, we, we're not just purely focused on primary standards um, and the SI because there's a growing need to understand more complex um, and prevalence of indirect hybrid and proxy measurements and, and how you in effect um, validate those uh, and then articulate them into to, to making the correct decisions. Um, and we've got to appreciate that there'll be data of different quality provenance and time periods. So it's that multimodal um, metadata aspect that is becoming more and more of a challenge. And so how, how are we building quality frameworks and quality assessments that makes one data set more applicable for a particular application than another? Um, and making sure that if you've, you've got four very high quality data sets and one that isn't, and you, you're using all of them, well, it, it, is, is that going to give the, the, the necessary and the required outcome um, because of the, the, the quality frameworks that you've built in and that you understand, or is it actually going to skew and affect 
um, the confidence in the data that you get or the confidence in the outputs that you get from whatever processing is, is done with that data. Um, and I think this is a wider question than, than just metrology. I think we're all struggling with this challenge as to the, the, the quality assessment of, of data um, and the data sets we're using and the provenance that it's got um, uh, is, is a big issue, particularly in air observation. Um, and then building on confidence in decision making is very much where we're, we're focusing as a, as a national lab. Um, it's, it's been able to be agile and responsive to regulation. Things are moving quickly. We're in a digital world where there's, there's, there's a belief and approach that things like digital twins uh, are a replacement for um, accurate measurement and understanding of data flows. Um, they have a place to, 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 to support but I think if we're moving to a point where we think that smarter testing is all about model-based approaches, then I think MPO would caution that some physical um, measurement has to underpin the decisions that are taken by models, by digital twins. Um, maybe it's controversial, maybe not. Um, I'm interested in comments and suggestions that come through. Um, and so if we view the information value chain from a from a metrology perspective there's there's often um and how this fits with where we're heading in terms of what we're trying to do with metrology there's often a tendency to jump from real world data acquisition to decisions and inference so we miss out the bottom two segments of the value chain and that's very much where the the, the areas of research and the aspects of data quality that we're focusing on as a lab um not just in data science across broadly across um, metrology um, to become a digital NMI has, has, has key benefits and a role to play. So again, comes back to that life cycle that I talked about, about storage and cleansing, annotation, integration, how you're linking data sets, the quality metrics related to those, to those data sets, and the models and algorithms that you're using, who's verifying them. If we go back to the autonomous vehicle example, um, who's, who's doing the, NLT, the MOT of the sensor systems on the vehicle? Um, we potentially will move much further away from the traditional MOT that we have currently about the physical capability of the car, much more to the software capability um, and the outputs of, of all of the sensor suite and algorithms that are used. Um, and who's fulfilling that role um, and, and how are we making sure that we've got confidence that that car you climb into um, can be trusted as much as you can trust the, the physical hardware of the car now that you currently have with, with an MOT. Um, diagnostics and reasoning and sensitivity of analysis and design of experiment. Design of experiment very much comes back to understanding of measurement. Um, is the measurement that you're taking in the first place fit and proper for purpose, um, regardless of the quality of data that is generated? Um, and then we can infer decisions. Then we can um, make decisions about the real world or apply models to deciding and making decisions around about the real world um, and predictions and prognostics and, and, and understanding new data requirements. Um, so I just wanted to use this diagram to really emphasize the bottom two aspects of the work that I think needs doing. I think people will recognize that many are looking at that in this space, um, but we're also mindful of how we address this challenge. And so if I move on to data governance and what we're looking at doing in terms of applying the FAIR principles um, and, 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 and using that to underpin metrology, at the, the international NMI community um, met recently in February where we, we had a, a, a week-long um, conference where FAIR was discussed in, in great detail and, and how findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable can be applied to understanding of measurement and used um, as, a, as a tool within, within metrology um, to make sure that it in effect supports what good data governance is. And so um, I've used a diamond guide here that um, many will be familiar with um, that just pulls out the aspects or the key, the 11 key areas of good data governance. And then you can see in a number of these where the actual measurement that generates the data has got a key role to play here, whether it's reference and master data that's used to, to validate and verify um, data quality metrics, uh, the metadata that's associated with the measurement and making sure that that can be used to, to, to track um, uh, traceability and data provenance, 
um, how data stored um, and curated. There's many aspects of this that, um, that I think by looking at it from a fair uh, lens, we, we are looking to try to understand and develop and work in these particular areas. Um, so I'll give a, a, a demonstration in a couple of slides of data curation and the way that you can use multimodal metadata to, to try to better understand provenance um, of experiments that have been conducted, who's done the, the experiment, all the way through to, to algorithms that have been applied and decisions that have been made. Um, but one thing that we're quite keen on, uh, to look at and doing some work around um, at MPL is, is a data management strategy, but roles and responsibilities within that. Um, so we're doing a fair bit of work of trying to understand the architecture that's needed. Um, so there is now a, a, a new BI team within MPL that, that is trying to grapple and get to grips with this so that it provides the infrastructure that we need as a digital organisation that then allows us to move towards digital metrology. Um, and then the roles and responsibility. So who are the data stewards, um, where that responsibility lies, um, just to try to embed that good data governance within us as an organization, but then also work with the, the NMI community to disseminate that internationally. Um, so one area where we're leading and doing exactly this is interacting through um, the digital curation center um, through the DMP online tool. Um, we really are, are trying to embed fair principles into data management plans um, and and lead that into good data management and governance. Um, and this, this is fairly recent work where we've rolled this out across all of our uh, national measurement system program. So we've just gone through a, a reformulation process where we decide what our focus should be as a lab in the next three to five years. Um, and on the back of this, the projects that have been selected um, will, will work with this DMP um, but it will do it in a way where we seek international, uh, national, international consensus from the European metrology community. Um, so that this has already generated interest from the Italian and the German NMI. Um, so it's been shared with them. They're reviewing it. They, they don't currently have anything that's been developed as fit for purpose for them as an institute. So I think we're taking the lead here in trying to apply the fair principles um, to try to underpin um, good data governance. So where are we as an organization more broadly? Because I'm talking very much from a science perspective around DMPs. Um, so we do have a data and digital strategy um, that looks to have these strategic principles or does have these strategic principles, um, whether it's focused on, uh, whether it's digital by default all the way to, through to cloud first and data managed as a trusted asset. Um, but we've got key themes that are un underneath those strategic principles. And I've, I've circled the one that really speaks to what we're doing in data science, but actually more broadly across the lab. Um, so we, we have different directions within MPL as you would in any organization. So science and engineering are very much taking on this challenge around digital governance and knowledge management. Um, and the DMP is one example uh, of how we're, we're putting in place that, that that data governance to make sure that the data is fit for purpose. Um, so, so in effect, we're all aligning um, good practice that already exists externally that you'll all be aware of in, in the, the, the fields that you work with the understanding of the data generation at the very inception. So the, the measurement aspect, the metrology of data curation, uh, data creation. Um, so how does that actually look within the lab? Um, so there's just wanted to give an example of a particular project that is that is that is coming to completion and will be published as an MPL report. Um, and so this this is focused very much on automatic traceable data curation. Um, so at the top we've got the flow diagram uh, with modules and steps in the code, um, and below that is the graphical representation. And what we're attempted to do here is just try to visually. Um, explain and the report that will be published will go into much more detail as to how this has been achieved um, as to all of the challenging aspects that you've got on a project that this work was developed upon so this this was done on the uh, cancer research uk grand challenge um, project that 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 has been ongoing within MPL for three and a half years now that creates uh, large volumes of data, but is actually a, a multi-party uh, consortium 
um, that has got many different uh, um, measurement modalities in it at many different scales and time frames. And so it's understanding how that sample information that comes from um, collaboration partners um, is then integrated with um, sample storage systems, the experimentalists that are doing the work on it, how the raw data that already exists feeds into the, the metadata and the ontologies that you need to develop, um, how you then need to create interfaces so that the user in the lab um, can actually access and, and use it in a way that is intuitive and allows you to then uh, feed the information into um, the, the the curated database that we've we've got at MPL, so that we're using a, a Tashi object store, um, and then what that generates in terms of, of automated reporting. But the, the whole idea of this curation project is very much going back to, um, as I've said a number of times, that understanding of the measurement um, and the measurement being fit for purpose, combining it with that that provenance of of good data quality uh, management, um, in effect, to create. Um, the traceability chain and a provenance uh, of all of the experiments that are run um, on, on many, many iterations on, that generate many, many volumes of data. Um, so this, this, this is a good example of where we're trying to combine that best practice with the understanding of metrology. Um, so if I'm, I move on to how we communicate the work that we are doing or the role that we've, we, we feel we have to play um, in, in aligning that aspects of, of metrology with good data governance. Um, it's very much around education, dissemination and standards. Um, measurement standards is, is an area that we're particularly focused on as we move into digital metrology and being that highest point of reference. So it, it, it may not be a primary standard um, just because of how things are moving to do, do, do much more complex systems that derived units I spoke about earlier. But it's making sure that we interact with the national quality in infrastructure um, and the partners are all listed there on the right hand side to make, to, to, to make sure that we're, we're, we're developing or we're contributing to agile regulation and standards. Um, that means that whatever progress is made in particular areas, and let's come back to a short autonomy, for example, and, and how we regulate the use of autonomous vehicles, um, that, that, that it's done in a way that it's, that, that it's fit for purpose, building upon that understanding of the measurement aspect at the first point and how the data is generated. Um, and this, this is also core to our NMI role and what's happening in the international scene. Um, so there is very much a focus now, particularly from PTB and NIST in the US, as to understanding what a digital framework for the international system of units looks like um, and how we try to align with that and develop an international consensus. So metrology has always existed on the basis of international comparisons. So there is a community there that are looking at all of the challenges around AI standards, for example. Um, and who's working in that area, who's developing the standards and making sure that we've got cross-party consensus so that we're, we're all speaking the same language and we develop an infrastructure that, that is internationally uh, speaking and, and, and sound and fit for purpose and not just nationally. Um, and that the, the bottom image really is just, um, just to, to flag the fair and digital data conference that took place um, as part of uh, BIPM. Um, and MPL significantly contributed to that, but it really was a focus of where metrology is heading. And again, it comes back to that message that I, I think I've communicated to three times is that how is the data generated? It's the quality of the data through understanding of accurate and, and, and correct measurement. So um, one other area that we share our work is through skills and training. Um, and just sharing that knowledge, providing e-learning modules, um, just internal seminars that has been drafted into external publications, um, and just some work that we've done around machine learning for metrology. Um, and just to, to flag that, that this was provided on the Ingenuity platform to try to break some of the mystique around machine learning, but actually come at it from a metrology perspective um, to, to make sure that it, it, you've, got, you've got an understanding of explainability of AI, but actually also trustworthiness. Um, the, the website link in the bottom left-hand corner provides a lot more information. Um, I think 
find it quite useful if you look at that as to just how MPL's remit to create impact um, can also work from a, from a training perspective as well. So I'm there at the end of the presentation. Um, so I just wanted to really flag that if we think of confidence in data um, as the understanding of how you collect the data, how it's connected, um, and then what you do to comprehend that, then it builds confidence um, in that data through making sure that you're, in, you're embedding measurement into the end-to-end -end process. And this enables all of those key bullet points on the right-hand side. There's, there's many more. Um, it's, it's early days in terms of moving towards this digital NMI and, and, and really having this focus on confidence in data. But data management um, and making data good for society um, underpins all this. I think all of the things that you'll have heard this week um, will, will align with or, or make you um, make it obvious that the, data, it's the quality of data um, is the, the key aspect that matters. And from a metrology aspect, it's making sure that measurement at the very heart, the beginning of the, the data generation is fit for purpose and accurate. Um, my final slide is why, why, is, why does it matter? Um, why measurement, What? why does NPL need to be involved in this particular area? So I'll go back to that comment from the Prince of Wales in 1902 when NPL was opened. Um, and really that's not changed as a mission statement. It's still relevant today. And there's just a few uh, pictures there that goes into a little bit more detail. So the famous case of the Uber autonomous vehicle that, that had quite a serious accident, Tesla's full self-driving um, 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 dashboard or um, pictorial that, that shows the interaction with the local environment and how challenging that is and the accuracy of that information that's collected. The bottom left hand image is, is the Truce program. So this is a large satellite mission that MPL is involved in where it's looking to, to in effect, validate and calibrate um, Earth's observation sa uh, satellites through its understanding of radiometry. Um, without that, how are we trusting the data that's collected by those satellites? How can we really make informed decisions um, when it comes to clim climate change? And then just a couple of others, how outages of the internet, how challenges around comms, um, and how are we actually really going to trust climbing in an autonomous vehicle unless we, we, we can really be confident um, in the outputs of these systems? And the final bullet or the final uh, highlighted text there is just a, a, an interesting story around COVID vaccinations and the vaccination program. So I was quite interested to hear recently that there was no international standard consensus around the data um, used for validation and, and approval of vaccines which as remarkable as the vaccine program has been for COVID-19 and as quick a progress was, we've made, we would have been much quicker or significantly quicker if there had been that international consensus. Now that has been changed, but that's just one example of where it's taken a pandemic for us to really get to grips with quality of data, how it's curated um, and standardization of, of data formats and data sharing. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much, Stuart. Um, it's been a uh, you know, great presentation, um, an awful lot of material you've covered there. Um, the, particularly the uh, one aspect highlight was the idea of uh, um, building data quality in from source. So really capturing um, the reliability of information at the moment it's created and then propagating through um, that idea of reliability or, or uncertainty so that, you know, all the way through the, 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 the information lifecycle, um, you, you've got that, um, you know, you, you know exactly what you're dealing with and, and the quality is graded. Um, I have to be honest, you know, in, in, if, if I was able to do that in some of the business systems I work with, um, then uh, life would be a, a lot easier. Um, before we go to questions, I um, just want to check with um, Alex. Alex, are you okay to, to talk us through um, what you captured there from the journalism side and, 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 um, and showcase your work? Okay, I'm happy to show it. I won't talk you through it because there's quite a lot to go into there. And it's already quite running late on time, so I'll let you have a look and make your own, <laughs> make your own conclusions. Do you want me to stop sharing? Does yes, that please. help? And then if, yeah. we, if we could just spotlight that, if we could spotlight the journalism. There we go. Okay. okay a lot of detail in there. Um, I think, uh, yes. Yeah, so anyone who wants to uh, have a collection of notes, um, this will be, uh, you know, I think we're issuing these at, at the end of the, uh, at the end of the series um, as a graphical um, 
capture of, uh, of the thing. So we've got a little bit of time for, for some questions. So I'll uh, go back to, uh, so Stuart, so let me just have a look, what have we got here? Um, so you have covered many different data types, scans, LIDAR, et cetera, which are all likely to have some common and some different features. How challenging are these differences? Um, significantly so. Um, in the regard of, if you think of um, sensor drift, for example, so the, the variability will be different upon the, the modality. Um, and that is something that has obviously got to be taken into account, particularly if the, 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 the network or the, the sensors themselves um, feed in um, with different weightings, and I, I particularly when you're then weighting algorithms as well. So I, I think that that is that is a particular concern and something that does need to be to, to be taken on board. Okay, um, and here's an interesting question. Um, might need a bit of explanation, but um, you know what what do you do if the measuring technique itself impacts the end result? How how do you capture that and propagate that through? Yeah, that that is, that is a real concern and challenge. Um, it, 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 so, if you th thinking of specific examples, um, it, it's it, it is something that has to be factored in, and then again, it comes down to to weighting of that um, the impact. Now, now, sometimes the the effect may be um, small in terms of its uncertainty. Um, and can be, I wouldn't use the word disregarded, but how doesn't have the prevalence that um, that inaccurate measurement would would have. Um, but it but it is a challenge and something that does have to be bear in mind. Okay, um, you mentioned um, AI and and um, sort of black box processing, um, and mindful of the um, the high profile um, post office case recently that where um, a, a miscarriage of justice was overturned. Um, that the you know, the source of which was um, you know, incorrect data effectively. Um, do you see that, um, that there's possibility for um, third party certification by um, people like the MPL um, in, in data change to actually, you know, validate um, the, the, the integrity of, of that data to decision making process? Yeah, so I think if you look at it from a risk assurance perspective, there's often three parties, isn't there? And then and, and somebody has to, in effect, be the counter to, to assuring and validating. Um, Yes, the, the potentially whether it's MPL um, or a, a, another body, um, but I think there's definitely a role to be played there because until that happens, I think we'll always struggle with adoption. Um, wh whether a single organisation could take on the 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 weight of accountability or the liability is a different story altogether. But it, but it's definitely a requirement. I think of the nuclear industry, for example, let alone getting past regulation. Um, deployment of AI into that type of industry, it comes with significant challenges um, and, and liability aspects. And I, I, But I think there's a role left to be played by an independent body. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got one last question. Um, it's from me. Um, you know, if, if someone is interested in, in your presentation and they think, ah, you know, I'd really, I could use that. Um, where could they go to, to reuse all or parts of, of, of your framework? How would they, um, you know, how would they go about um, you know, in, integrating that in, into whatever work they're doing. Um, very happy to for people to reach out directly to me. I think the MPL website is a good place to start. Um, but we do also work on projects collaboratively um, across partners, um, depending on the the, the domain, um, the, the 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 science area and domain. Um, so there's opportunities there to, to get in, involved in consortium and collaboration. But we also work um, externally through consultancy as well. So if there are companies that want to reach out, they've got particular challenges that they think MPL could address, um, then we do also work um, in that way as well. So we'd be very happy to, to, to have a conversation and discussion about how that would work. Okay, great. Um, in that case, I think that brings us nicely to the end of the hour. Um, so it all remains for me to say thank you very much, Stuart, um, and, uh, and remind everyone that um, we have one more final webinar tomorrow morning, uh, followed by a panel discussion in the afternoon. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you.